glorious bag. I'm sure it will be. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. The whole earth is full of His glory. Let us prepare ourselves to delight in His glory this morning. Join with me for our call to worship. My soul makes its boast in the Lord. Let the humble hear and be glad. Oh, magnify the Lord with me. And let us exalt his name together. Let's stand and sing together hymn three, uh, sorry, hymn 213. We will glorify.
our hearts together in prayer. Lord, we read of a king who prayed the dedication of a temple. And the coming of your glory filling that temple. Father, we can scarce imagine what that was like. None of us are kings. And we do not live in a nation with a king. And yet, we are the people of the King of Kings. And it is in His name that we come before you today. And it is in His name that we ask that you would send among us the fire of your Holy Spirit and that you would fill this place with your glory. That we may know you as our God and delight in you as such. And this is our prayer together. In Christ's name, Amen. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins to deliver us from the present evil age according to the will of our God and Father, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let's greet one another in the Lord. It's going to be a medley of this is holy ground and holy ground. So let's stand and sing together. You want to? You want to? That was the last time. Okay. All right. Oh 
Hear the word of the Lord from Psalm 73. Truly God is good to Israel, to those who are pure in heart. But as for me, my feet had almost stumbled. My steps had nearly slipped. For I was envious of the arrogant when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. For they have no pangs until death. Their bodies are fat and sleek. They are not in trouble as others are. They are not stricken like the rest of mankind. Therefore, pride is their necklace. Violence covers them as a garment. Their eyes swell out through fatness. Their hearts overflow with follies. They scoff and speak with malice. Loftily, they threaten oppression. They set their mouths against the heavens and their tongue struts 
through all the earth. Therefore his people turn back to them and find no fault in them. And they say, how can God know? Is there knowledge in the Most High? Behold, these are the wicked, always at ease. They increase in riches. All in vain have I kept my heart clean and washed my hands in innocence. For all the day long I have been stricken and rebuked every morning. If I had said, I will speak thus, I would have betrayed the generation of your children. But when I thought how to understand this, it seemed to me a wearisome task until I went into the sanctuary of God. Then I discerned their end. Truly, you set them in slippery places. You make them fall to ruin. How are they destroyed in a moment, swept utterly away by terrors? Like a dream when one awakes. O oh Lord, when you rouse yourself, you despise them as phantoms. When my soul was embittered, when I was pricked in heart, I was brutish and ignorant. I was like a beast toward you. Nevertheless, I am continually with you. You hold my right hand. You guide me with your counsel, and afterward you will receive me to glory. Whom have I in heaven but you? And there is nothing on earth that I desire besides you. My heart, my flesh, and my heart may fail. But God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. For behold, those who are far from you shall perish. You put an end to everyone who is unfaithful to you. But for me, it is good to be near God. I have made the Lord God my refuge, that I might tell of your good works. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Join me in singing hymn number six, Immortal, Invisible, God, Only Wise.
may be seated. As we stand in the presence of God, who is holy and righteous, we are often aware of the sin that still abides within us. So let us go together and confess our sins to our Father. Merciful and gracious Heavenly Father, we ask that you would forgive us for making you small, for ignoring your immensity and greatness. Lord Jesus, forgive us when we forget that you are Lord, that you rule the nations just as you rule our very lives. Holy Spirit, we confess that we too often minimize your power. We squander your gifts. How blind we are to your glory, God. But now in the light of your glory, we see and we confess that such short-sightedness and self-absorption has often resulted in shallow confession, lukewarm conviction, and sadly, mild repentance. Have mercy upon us. This we ask in the blessed name of Christ Jesus, our Lord and our Savior. Amen. Hear now the good news. For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. Through faith in Christ Jesus, you are forgiven. Let us give thanks to God with the words of 1 Timothy 1.17. To the King of the ages, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. Knowing that loving grace, be mindful of God's will for your lives. Do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God? You are not your own, for you were bought with a price. So glorify God in your body. We prepare to worship God through giving. I remind you that uh, we are, this is really supposed to be the final Sunday of our, our Christmas ministry fund offering, and uh, we're about 800 and something dollars shy of our goal, which uh, is an important goal for us to reach, to be able to uh, share Christmas gifts with children in the Georgia Baptist Children's Home, as well as some local families. So I ask that you prayerfully consider your gift to that, as well as your, your normal offerings and tithes to the ministry of our church. As we prepare to worship in this way, we're going to remain seated and sing hymn 638. Now thank we all our God.
Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for sending your Son so that we might be saved. Be with our world leaders that they may work together to search for your will. We encourage each of you to make a special offering for our Christmas fund to express our joy of Christ. The offering we freely give today to be used for your glory. In your name we pray. Amen. God's word read and proclaimed to us. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Merciful Father, we ask that you would give us ears to hear your glorious word. Give us minds to comprehend your glorious ways. And give us eyes to behold your glory all around us. This we ask in Christ's name. Amen. The Old Testament lesson for today is Isaiah 48, 3 through 11. The former things I declared of old, they went out from my mouth and I announced them. Then suddenly I did them and they came to pass. Because I know that you are obstinate and your neck is an iron sinew and your forehead brass, I declared them to you from of old. 
Before they came to pass, I announced them to you. Least you should say, my idol did them. My carved image and my metal image commanded them. You have not heard, now see all this, and will you not declare it? From this time forth I, now, I announce to you new things, hidden things that you have not known. They are created now, not long ago. Before today you have never heard of them, least you should say, behold, I knew them. You have never heard, you have never known. From of old your ear has not been opened, for I knew that you would surely deal treacherously and that from before birth you were called a rebel. For my name's sake I defer my anger. For the sake of my praise I restrain it for you, that I may not cut, off, cut you off. Behold, I have refined you, but not of silver. I have tried you in the furnace of affliction. For my own sake, for my own sake I do it. For how should my name be profaned? My glory I will not give to another. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Hear the word of the Lord from Paul's letter to the uh, Romans. Lest you be wise in your own sight, I do not want you to be unaware of this mystery, brothers. A partial hardening has come upon Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. And in this way, all Israel will be saved as it is written. The deliverer will come from Zion he will banish ungodliness from Jacob. And this will be my covenant with them when I take away their sins. As regards the gospel, they are enemies for your sake. But as regards election, they are beloved for the sake of their forefathers. For the gifts and the calling of God are irrevocable. For just as you were at one time disobedient to God, but now have received mercy because of their disobedience, so they too have now been disobedient in order that by the mercy shown to you, they may also now receive mercy. For God has consigned all to disobedience that he may have mercy on all. Oh, the depth of the riches and wisdom of the knowledge of God, how unsearchable are his judgments and how inscrutable his ways. For who has known the mind of the Lord, or who has been his counselor, or who has given a gift to him that he might be repaid? For from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be the glory forever. Amen. And now the gospel lesson from the 17th chapter of the Gospel of John. When Jesus had spoken these words, he lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son, that the Son may glorify you, since you have given him authority over all flesh to give eternal life to all whom you have given him. And this is, the eternal, this is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. I glorified you on earth, having accomplished the work that you gave me to do. And now, Father, glorify me in your own presence with the glory I had with you before the world existed. This is the word of God. Thanks be to God. Today we come to the last of our five sermon series uh, marking the 500th anniversary of the Protestant Reformation, in which we've been looking at what we call the solas, the alones of uh, these, these hallmarks and uh, somewhat slogans of the Protestant Reformation. We began with that of Scripture alone, reminding ourselves that it is Scripture alone which is the infallible authority and source of Christian belief and practice. And then we noted uh, three solas that really sort of go together and speak to salvation, the nature and our understanding of salvation. We are saved, we're justified, we are given right standing with God by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ Jesus alone. And today we look at the final of these five solas. Soli Deo Gloria, to the glory of God alone. 
In many ways, this simple phrase binds up the previous four solas. At the same time, I think it gives us a clear sense of our, our purpose in this new life which we have in Christ Jesus. First, I want us uh, to remember, I want to kind of remind you, maybe at myself as well, that soli deo gloria, to the glory of God alone, is not a mere reformational slogan. It is an abiding biblical principle. God displays His glory in all things. God seeks His glory in all things. That is, God seeks to manifest the beauty, the majesty, the wonder of who He is and in all the ways that He operates. And He does this in every aspect of our lives, in every aspect of of creation. So you, I want you to sort of bear with me. I'm going to take us on a biblical tour in, in many ways of, of this idea. First, we can start with creation. For God's creation is all about His glory. Psalm 19, very famous words. The heavens declare the glory of God, and the sky above proclaims His handiwork. Isaiah 3, 6. And no one called to another and said, I mean, and one called to another and said, Holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. So as Isaiah has this vision of, of the heavenly temple, the heavenly throne room. There, the seraphim who surround God say this to one another. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. When Paul, uh, sort of in contemplating God's ways and salvation in, in our reading from Romans 11 today, at the conclusion of that doxology, he says, For from Him and through Him and to Him are all things. All things are from God. They come to Him, they come to us through Him. They are for his, for, from Him, to Him, to His glory forever. Of course, our deepest desire as God's image bearers is in fact the glory of God. When Moses stands before God, he asks for one thing. Please show me your glory. The psalmist in Psalm 115, Not to us, O Lord, not to us, but to your name give glory. And John, in sort of thinking about this gift of the incarnate Christ, when he thinks about the wonder of, of who Jesus was, he describes it in this way in John 1.14. The Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen His glory. Glorious of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. Now, having been made in God's image, to give glory to Him and to delight in His glory, our sin, our rebellion against God, directly relates to our ability to delight in God's glory. In Romans 3.23, Paul says, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Psalm 106.20, speaking of humanity, they exchanged the glory of God for the image of an ox that eats grass. Paul sim sums up a similar paradox, a strangeness about our predicament. When in Romans 1.23 it says, We exchange the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal man and birds and animals and creeping things. In John 12, even those who had the, the gift of God's revelation, even those who had been told to, to have no other God before them. John relates this way, Nevertheless, many, even of the authorities, believed in Him, believed in Jesus, but for fear of the Pharisees, they did not confess it, so that they would not be put out of the synagogue, for they loved the glory that comes from man more than the glory comes from God. 
Oh, what a predicament we are in in our sin. How misguided we are. Well, is that okay with God? Well, no. I am the Lord. That is my name. My glory I give to no other, nor my praise to carved idols. So when God sets out to redeem us, He does so for His own glory. In all the stages and all the elements of that redemption. Again, in Isaiah 43, when God speaks about this nation that He formed in this redemptive purpose in history, He says, Everyone who is called by name, my name, whom I created for my glory, whom I formed and made. These chosen people that God redeemed to begin this salvation history, He did so for His glory. And in all the working out, of that salvation. When God went to deliver the Israelites from Egypt, God said, I will harden Pharaoh's heart and he will pursue them and I will get glory over Pharaoh and all his hosts and the Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord. Even in the hardening of Pharaoh's heart, God was seeking his glory. Again, in that passage from Romans 11, Paul speaks of much of the same mystery. That in this salvation, as God extends the salvation to all the Gentiles, a partial hardening has happened to Israel. Paul's own people. And yet at the conclusion of that great mystery and contemplation, Paul can speak of the glory that is due to God, an eternal glory. In Exodus 24, it is there after this redemption, there in the wilderness, that we read, The glory of the Lord dwelt on Mount Sinai, and the cloud covered it six days. On the seventh day, the Lord called to Moses out of the midst of the cloud. Now the appearance of the glory of the Lord was like a devouring fire on the top of the mountain in the sight of the people of Israel. Or think about the own, uh, our own understanding of our redemption in Jesus Christ. Not just this magnificent exodus event, but our own exodus that we know in Christ Jesus that begins with the incarnation. Very famous words we have that the angels give the shepherds, right? Fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all people. And then there is a choir, a host of angels that join in. And what is their word? Good news to you guys. No. Glory to God in the highest. Our gospel lesson comes from this prayer that Jesus prayed in the Garden of Gethsemane. The cross mere hours away. This great event of our redemption. And what are the first words out of Jesus' mouth? He lifted up His eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify Your Son that the Son may glorify You. In fact, Throughout his life, Jesus sought the Father's glory. John 7, 18, the one who speaks on his own authority seeks his own glory. But the one who seeks the glory of him who sent him is true, and in him there is no falsehood. Jesus says, I am seeking the Father's glory. I speak on his authority, not my own. And in turn, it is the Father who glorified God the Son. Jesus said in John 8, 54, If I glorify myself, my glory is nothing. It is my Father who glorifies me, of whom you say, He is our God. So here it is in this great moment of redemption. At the heart of that is the glory of God. God seeking to glorify Himself and make His glory known. But even in what comes after, our sanctification, this life that God gives us in Christ, that too is about God's glory. In Isaiah 48, our Old Testament reading, God speaks of this sanctifying, this this redeeming of, of Israel, of showing mercy to them and of refining them, having tried them in the furnace of affliction, of affliction, 
God says, for my own sake, for my own sake I do it. For how should my name be profaned? My glory I will not give to another. Jesus speaks about the way we are to live our lives, being salt and light. He says, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and pat you on the back. Nope. That they may see your good works and what? Glorify your Father who is in heaven. Even in heaven, the overwhelming presence of God's glory is the source of all light and joy and life. When Isaiah speaks of that day in Isaiah 60, he says, The sun shall be no more your light by day, nor for brightness shall the moon give you light, but the Lord will be your everlasting light, and your God will be your glory. John sees much the same in Revelation 21. He says, The city has no need of sun or moon to shine on it, for the glory of God gives it light. Its lamp is the Lamb. By its light will the nations walk, and the kings of the earth will bring their glory into it. So, look, that is this big sweeping account of a portion of what Scripture says about the glory of God. How it begins in the very creation of the world, runs through our redemption, and is in fact at the heart of our eternal home. Seems to me that we could join in with that reformer John Calvin and say, indeed, all of the universe is the theater of God's glory. So if it's all about God's glory, then it seems to me that we should begin to see the importance of what the reformers were saying, that our salvation is by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. And that God's redemption is coming to us through His own revelation, not through our discovery of Him. That famous passage I read a few minutes ago from Romans 3, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, Paul follows it up and says, and are justified by His grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as a propitiation by His blood, to be received by faith. This was to show God's righteousness. Because in His divine forbearance, He had passed over former sins. It was to show His righteousness at the present time so that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. And then Paul asks this question. What becomes of our boasting? And he answers it. It is excluded. We've all fallen short of the glory of God. And so it was God who set out to redeem us. It was God who set out to bring salvation to us who had rebelled against Him. And God did all of that work. It is God who sent His Son. It is God who put Him forward as a propitiation. And how is it that we're going to earn that salvation? We're not. We can only receive it as a gift through faith. And so what does that do for all of our, our glorious selves? Well, it pretty much knocks us down. It excludes any boasting that we might have. Because it is all about God. To the Corinthians, Paul has a similar observation. He says, consider your calling. Not consider your decision, not consider your reasoning, not consider that day that you all, all of a sudden figured it out. Consider your calling. Consider the time when Christ called out to you. Not many of you were wise according to worldly standards. Not many were powerful. Not many were of noble birth, but God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world, even things that are not, to bring to nothing things that are, so that no human being might boast in the presence of God. Because of Him, you are in Christ Jesus, who became to us wisdom from God, righteousness and sanctification and redemption. 
so that as it is written, let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. In the Lord. Let the one who wants to glory, glory in the Lord, not in oneself. You see, our salvation is not about our worthiness, but rather it is about the glory of God's mercy and grace. Our salvation is not about how special or how lovable we are. Rather, it is about how special God's love is. Our salvation is not about our knowledge or our spirituality or our righteousness. It is about God and God's glory alone. We also begin to see how this guiding principle shapes the purpose of our lives. If God has created us, if He has, if he has redeemed us, if He sanctifies us for His own glory, then it seems to me we should seek God's glory in all things. In our worship. I love this verse in Psalm 29.9. Psalmist writes this, The voice the Lord makes the deer give birth and strips the forest bare. And in his temple all cry, and the psalmist just gives one word, Glory. Glory. When we consider God's good gifts to us, salvation, we should join our voice with Paul as he says in Romans 11, Oh, the depth of the riches and wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are His judgments. How inscrutable His ways. For who has known the mind of the Lord? Or who has been His counselor? Or who has given a gift to Him that He might be repaid? For from Him and through Him and to Him are all things. To Him be glory forever. When we love, when we do good to others. Indeed, let, our, let us let our light shine before others that they may see our good works and give glory to our Father who is in heaven. But you see, that seems to be pretty much what any Christian could agree with, right? I mean, that's why you can sort of come to church, you know, give glory to God. But that's not where the Bible stops, is it? For whether you eat or drink, or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. I don't know where you're going for lunch today. I'm not sure what's going to be on your mind. Usually it's, for me, what I like, and you know, how hungry I am, and how fat do I really want to get, that kind of stuff. Paul says, my controlling thought and principle should be this. The glory of God, even in eating and drinking. All of our lives are to be oriented toward that purpose. There is no private and public. There is no sacred or secular. All is before God. All is to be lived to the glory of God. Each moment is a gift from Him, given to us that we might glorify Him. Finally, I want to just address a question that I think a lot of people sometimes have when we, when we speak of this. Because if, if God really is all about His own glory, then not that sort of make God selfish? Doesn't that sort of make God self-centered or self-serving? Let me put it to you this way. If I had the greatest, most perfect gift, and I kept that gift to myself, would that make me selfish? Yes, it would. But what if I gave that gift to another that they might delight in that gift? Well, that would in no way be self-serving. Do you understand that is what God has done? The old Baptist catechism 
didn't begin with the question that sometimes we, you know, what is the chief end of man? The chief end of man is to glorify God and enjoy him forever. There's another Baptist catechism, there's a Baptist catechism that came later that, later that actually started with this question. Who is the first and best of all beings? The first and best of all beings is God. And that sort of sets it all into a different, different dynamic, doesn't it? If the very best of all that there is, is God, and God gives himself to us, to delight in him and to glorify him. Well, that's not self-serving at all. That is a very selfless act, born out of the sheer gracious gratuity, the, the overwhelmingness of God's love and desire to share himself with us. Psalm 73 is a story of a person who moves in two realms of reality. At first, he moves to the realm of mankind, where people seek their own glory, the glory of riches, and doing so, they, they oppress, and they act as if God just doesn't see. And then, she enters the presence of God, the, the greatest reality, if you will. And it's in that reality that one finds the desires of one's heart. As the psalmist says, Whom have I in heaven but you? And there is nothing on earth that I desire besides you. And the realization that giving glory is itself the desire of one's heart. The desire of that greatest good, the psalmist says, but for me, it is good to be near God. I have made the Lord God my refuge, that I may tell of all your works. See, suddenly the psalmist realizes, in God seeking His own glory, there's nothing self-serving about it at all. God is giving Himself to us. And the psalmist finds suddenly, there is the greatest desire of my heart. What more could there be to be near God? To tell of His works, to glorify Him. Well, brothers and sisters, I pray that this will be the case for each and every one of us. That we too will know the delight of living to the glory of God alone. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Response to God's word. Brothers and sisters, what is the chief end of man? The chief end of man is to glorify God and enjoy Him forever. And what does 1 Corinthians 10 31 teach us? So whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. As we continue to respond to God's word, let's sing Him for to God be the glory.
be seated. Remind you of a few things that are going on. One, um, sign up sheets for scripture readings. If you'd like to be uh, involved in this ministry of reading the psalm in the worship service, there are sign up sheets. I know there's one right outside this door in, in the Sunday school classes. Orange sheet of paper, just feel free to sign your name there. Handbells will practice this afternoon, regular times for joyful noise and adult handbells. And then um, next Sunday, we're going to have a service of thanksgiving. Now, what that means is this service is really dependent upon you being thankful and coming ready to share your thanksgiving, uh, to, to declare it before this congregation and to the Lord. So I hope that you will be spending this week thinking about what it is you're going to be uh, thankful for and ready to share that next Sunday. Um, also, next Sunday, the deacons will have a meeting after Sunday school in the church library. And then, of course, um, we may have our Christmas ministry offering extended, depending on how close we are to our goal. But please, I hope you'll continue to pray about that uh, and your gift toward that. All right, um, as we get ready for our time of prayer, I'll ask you to come down here uh, around the, the pulpit area. And um, let me share with you a few things I hope that you'll be praying about. One, uh, today is traditionally Remembrance Day, a day of uh, remembering those who have, who have uh, served and given their lives uh, in defense of our freedoms and protecting us from harm by uh, uh, serving in our military. And we want to remember them and give thanks for them. I uh, also ask that you uh, be praying for Roger Hales. Roger managed to, was able to join us last Sunday, even though he had a, a bit of a fall on Saturday, and then he found himself in the hospital not long after that. Please be praying for Roger and Jane at this time. Um, uh, Jana Lantham has, has been uh, here part of our church for, for a few months now. She has a sister named Donna who is in bad shape, and she asked us to be praying for her. And then um, Randall has an appointment tomorrow with the heart doctor about this possible um, bypass surgery. So please be praying for Randall in that appointment. And Chuck, Chuck had a, had a nasty wreck on Friday. And uh, I think that's right. In, was that right, Chuck? Uh, got rear-ended and in some pain. So please uh, be praying for Chuck. And let's remember this church out in Texas uh, and those who are grieving in this a very difficult time. All right, with that, let's, let's go to the Lord together in prayer. Father, we, we come before you thankful for all your goodness, thankful that even in great conflict, you are with us, guiding us. We thank you for those who have, who have served us and protected us in our freedoms, asking that you would comfort them and their families in in these days. We lift up to you Roger, asking that you would strengthen him and Jane, guide them through this uh, very difficult time. And for Donna and her family, for Jana, we, we ask for comfort and strength and healing. We pray especially, Father, for, for Randall and this upcoming appointment. We know so many of the complications that can be involved with, with diabetes and what lies ahead. We pray for your protection. And for wisdom. Strengthen Chuck and alleviate this pain that he is experiencing. We, we pray especially, Father, for our brothers and sisters out in Texas who are mourning this day, who, who have experienced a great tragedy, something unspeakable and unknown. We, we always seek, Father. We, we desire to make Make these sanctuaries places of prayer and worship. And yet someone has turned it into a place of murder and carnage. We ask for your mercy, for your deliverance from this violence that we seem to be entangled in. We pray for comfort for those who mourn. Hear now our prayers, Father, as we offer them to you. Father, I pray that you be with Miss Wilma Hand as she takes care of her husband who's had a few seizures and a fall and 
I pray not only for her to have physical strength, but spiritual and emotional strength as well as she continues to um, care for him. Dear Father, I pray for Diane this morning that you'd bless her, bless her body and help her to find some answer to uh, the pain that she's been in this week and weeks before and that's gotten worse. I just pray that you'd help her to know what doctor to see or whatever to help alleviate that and just just bless her right now and thank you that God that you um, do heal and that you are with us through everything that we go through and I, I lift up to you Eric and Alex and and uh, Chuck Peake right now just bless bless them Jesus Evan Scott Evan Scott Father, hear us now as we pray the words that our Lord has taught us to pray. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Remember this word, brothers and sisters. We are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand. We should walk in them. Therefore, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. And may the God of endurance and encouragement grant you to live in such harmony with one another in accord with Christ Jesus, that together you may with one voice Glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Go in peace.